Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 613 of Project Shadow. My name's Charlie. Hi. How's everybody doing? I am a little bit self-conscious about today's episode just because I've decided to try to sequester all my talk about my work to Friday. And so welcome to our first Fiction Friday episode. And it's not just going to be talking about the books that I am working on and the stories that I'm working on or the world that I'm working on, but also my experiences working on it and some of the things that I'm trying. And it's going to be much more author centric than it is like buy my book because <laughs> you know that's you know that's not me i'm not i'm not that dude and if you're a fan of grime music then yeah you got a song stuck in your head now so ha 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 <laughs> but yeah so it's been quite a year last year was insane i wrote two books last year as you know um, or you might not, because I only published one of them. Um, I wrote Labyrinth of Souls and Crucify My Love. And Crucify is available on Wattpad. Both of them are actually available on Wattpad. So if you follow me over there, you'll be able to see them. But yeah, I did not go ahead and edit and publish Crucify. And I did that for a reason. Crucify is going to be a part of a series, and I've heard about this thing that some writers do where they bank up books and then release them, the, the entire series, over a year, and that's what I'm going to try to do with those books. But like I said, you can read drafts right now if you want over on my Wattpad, because I like to be open with everybody. So, for the majority of this year, I've been working actually on the sequel to Labyrinth of Souls, which will be called Stone of Heaven. It went through about seven different names before it got there, but I'm pretty sure it's Stone of Heaven now. And I'm actually pretty sure I know the name of the rest of the books in that series, as well as what's going to be happening in them. Because that's something I spent a lot of time doing after I discovered um, Keisho Tenketsu. I really went back to my original ideas and kind of played with them a little bit, and that got me to where I am now. So Kisho Tenketsu, if you're not familiar with it, is a style of... A style? I really don't know what to call it. I, I mean, technically, I guess if we're being really technical, it's a genre of writing. It's a class of writing. It's a clade of writing. <laughs> Uh, this is one of those things where I'd, it, it's a theory of writing that originated in the 15th century in China and spread through Japan and Korea as well. And so the idea is that the, a story has a four part structure and unlike Western European stories, which are based off of conflict and the entire theory of the story is based off of how that conflict comes about and is resolved, Keisho Tenketsu is about revelation and twist. So in the first phase, the K phase of the story, you introduce the world. In the show phase of the story, you develop that world further and show how it um, works. In the 10 phase, you actually introduce a twist that throws everything that you thought you knew about the world inside out and backwards. And in the Ketsu phase, you reconcile that twist with the world that you came to know. And if you're a fan of anime, if you are a fan of manga, if you love all of the Studio Ghibli movies with way too much fervor like I do, then you're, you're very familiar with this style of storytelling. 
because it's the one that you'll find most commonly in these types of stories. Now, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily conflict-free. It just means that the progression of the story often hinges more on the twist and the revelations in the story than off of the conflict itself. Which is a very different way to write and a very different way to think about story other than basically how do I get these people to fight and fight and fight and fight until finally one of them comes out victorious at the end, which, let's be honest, is what most three-act structure stories are about, whether it's through arguing or through literal fighting. That's how the stories are resolved. So I took some time and re-examined everything that I was working on through that light. And a lot of people that I know were talking about a book by John Truby called The Anatomy of Story. And I kept hearing quotes about this book, and this book was just kind of like haunting me. Because no matter where I went, whether it was in a YouTube video or in a podcast that I listened to or in some actual conversations that I had with people over the summer, this book kept coming up and I had never read it. So I decided to read it and it's, it's a very interesting read and I'm currently debating exactly how much of its methodologies I'm going to employ in my fiction. But all in all, it was a thoroughly enjoyable read and it really did make me think about fiction in a different way. And I like that. I think that, his idea of story structure when you actually get down to it, not the seven um, steps of, of story, but when you actually get to the 22 steps, I, I am, I'm not the biggest fan of that. And it's mainly because I, I one, like Blake Snyder and I like um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, the, the monomyth. But I, I've kind of gotten to a point in my writing where the story structure presents itself m much more, and I am enjoying that. So, it's trying to stay onto a 22-point story outline and using that as a basic recipe to make the story isn't something that I'm most excited about, so that's probably something that I won't be doing. But his idea of seeing backstory as the ghosts that haunt the setting and the characters, oh, I love that. I do love that. That's one idea from his 22 points of the story that I do like and will probably influence how I write the story going forward. But his idea of premise is one that I really enjoyed and one that I'll probably be using much more in future to vet the stories that I'm working on. So Stone of Heaven, like a lot of the stories that I write, because it's one of Blake Snyder's genres that I actually do write in a lot is a monster in the house story. And so I used his idea of the monster in the house to create the basic idea for the story. And that was the premise that I was operating under. And so that gives me the following premise line. The students of Sun Tzu Lin Academy must live under a wild hunt after a spirit escapes from the realm of the dead during the opening ceremonies of term. It, it was a workable premise. It was one that actually worked very well. It's just the one that I intended to do. But what his method, which to, has you tear that idea down and break it down into parts, such as the design principle, the characters, the conflict... Um, the basic action that they will take, the character change, and so so on, really made me reevaluate some of the things that I thought were going to go into the story in a way that I found extremely valuable and helpful. So, if nothing else, when coming up with stories in the future, I'll probably use his premise methods to kind of pick apart an idea to see if it is something that I really want to tell and what it actually looks like when I do that. The same is true with his seven steps um, of story. Now, the seven steps of story are very, very simple when you really think about them, 
but your character should have a psychological and a moral re realization. They should have a psychological and a moral weakness and need. They should have a problem at the very beginning of the story that is related to that need that is not necessarily related to the plot. They should have a desire, something they want to accomplish, an opponent, a plan, and a battle at the end that brings everything back together. Now, I know what you're thinking, especially if you've studied story theory at all, doesn't that sound like everybody else? And yes, to a certain extent, there is an element of, oh, duh, to a lot of the ideas that are presented in this and any other book on writing. But having said that, what this methodology did for me, especially because he does provide a methodology in the book for not only here's the theory, but here's how to go about doing that, that allowed me to work with the story that I had in my head and develop it over time. And so as I used his tools for, especially something like the design principle, to look at my story and the story that I wanted to tell, it, it changed some of the elements of the story and developed it and made it work in a way that I don't know if it would have if I hadn't gone through the system. And so for him, the design principle is the, um, to quote his book, actually, which I'll do real quick here. He says in The Anatomy of Story, come up with the design principle of your story idea. Remember that this principle describes some deeper process or form in which the story will play out in a unique way. The designing principle is what organizes the story as a whole. It is the internal logic of the story that makes the parts hang together organically so that the story becomes greater than the sum of its parts. It is what makes the story original. And he gives this equation. Design principle equals story process plus original execution. And so this is one of the places that I really disagree with him in reading the book because he uses as one of his many examples here the Harry Potter series. And I feel that he's referring to the films and not the books because what makes the Harry Potter series, I think, so interesting is the story process is we're telling essentially the story of King Arthur, right? This is the cho when you look at all seven books together, it's the chosen one who was raised in obscurity, discovers that he's special, and now has to learn how to defeat the bad guy, right? That's essentially the story of Harry Potter. But the original execution is J.K. Rowling wrote these books as cozy mysteries. And you can see this really prominently in the first book, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or Philosopher's Stone, depending on what country you're listening to me in, which follows the beats of a cozy mystery dot for dot for dot. Those beats are maintained through the rest of the series, even in the Deathly Hollows even though they become more obscured over time as the execution becomes more original and native to the world of Harry Potter. And that's, to me, what made those books so exciting, is instead of sending Harry on a quest, which even The Deathly Hollows really looks like a quest story, but it's not a quest story, it's a mystery novel. The main thrust of that book is, should Harry be going after the Horcruxes or the Hallows? And... He has to figure out what both are, where both are, and which is the most important thing. There's actually a mystery that has to be solved rather than just a quest item that must be regained. That is a very interesting twist on the fantasy genre because fantasy is a lot about quests to the point where that's kind of the stereotype of all fantasy fiction, right? Hi, I need you to go on a quest for me. Do this thing and the universe shall be saved. Okay, says our hapless hero and runs out to save the day. 
the design principle is an idea, and he goes on in a lot more detail about it in the book. And I do recommend that you read the book. It's a, it's an interesting read. It's a quick read. It's not very long. But it is something that we don't often think about when we're writing the book. It's kind of a byproduct of doing it, right? We don't sit down and go, so this is the story I'm telling, and this is the execution through which I'm going to tell the story. Now, for me, that could be a, a, as simple as it's a monster in the house story that's being executed through the method of Kisho Tenketsu, and so that's going to make it unique. And yeah, that would make it unique, but that's kind of boring. And so it made me actually sit back because pre prior to reading the book, that's kind of all I would have thought about for the design of the book and how the book is being put together as a story as I'm working on it. But because it made me sit back and think about it and really think about it, I ended up... <sighs> designing a different idea for the book and it augmented some of the basic ideas that I had for the book and it I think deepened the story and made it better and it was just this minor little thing that could have not affected me at all but for some reason it did and because this is a very complex story, it also helped out a lot because I was able to do this for all of the main, for all of the viewpoint characters of the book. Because I, I am, at least at this point, counting on the book having five viewpoint characters, which is quite a bit for some fiction. For fantasy fiction, not quite like a crazy amount, but it's quite a few viewpoint characters. And so I could see using this method and using his categories of dissecting the story how everyone's story interweaves with each other how they're related to each other and how they affect each other in a way that would have been evident in the writing but it would have created more of a struggle in me because especially the sequence towards the end you know which character should hit the end of their story first that was up for grabs in my head, and it's not anymore. I actually know the sequence in which each character is going to come to the end of their story line because of how it feeds into the overall story of the book, which wasn't at all clear to me at the beginning of this process. And so, while I have actually written several chapters of Stone of Heaven, I believe I'm up to five? Yeah, I have five written. I think I've posted five. Four. I may have posted all five of them, that, but I do post my works in process with all of my grammar and spelling mistakes and everything for your perusal over <laughs> on Wattpad because I want to get start getting your feedback as soon as possible. But it really made me rethink some of the things that I was doing. It made me like some of what I had already chosen and augmented some of the ideas that I had. And that, for me is the most powerful thing that I can get out of a writing book. Because so many writing books, at least at this point in my life, you know, I'm going to be 42 this year, I'm 41 right now, and so many writing books I've read before. <laughs> you know, there's only so many ways you can talk about what a character is, or what a plot is, or what a story is, or what a theme is, or what writing voice is. And so at a certain point, you feel like you've read it all. And there were a few concepts in this book that were articulated in a way that made me look at them differently. Even the things that I thought I had kind of ironed down and knew quite well, it went, hey, why haven't you thought about it this way? And I went, huh, why haven't I thought about it that way? That's actually a really interesting way to think about it. And so... It did actually broaden my horizons and made me feel like I have a stronger story to go forward on. And I can't ask for much more from a book about writing. So I didn't actually intend for this episode to be kind of, you know, a review of John Truby's Anatomy of Writing, but it's, it's a very good book that has, I think, helped me reconceptualize some of the stories that I'm working on, especially as I am 
more and more becoming what uh, Brandon Sanderson calls a discovery writer, which I was when I was younger, and then I became a very hardcore outliner, and I've kind of flitted back in the last couple years to writing off the cuff and seeing what happens, and I enjoy that. But I think one of the what makes that possible for me to be a pantser, to write by the seat of my pants like that, is that these stories that I am working on, I have a firm grasp of what they are going into it, so I kind of know some of the beats that are coming up. So that potential for writer's block that is present in kind of free writing like that doesn't have a chance to present itself to me. And that's a very good thing. And for someone like me who, like I said, is has become a pantser over the last couple of years and who is now writing more often without an outline than with one, this method has given me a way to lay a firmer foundation for me to build off of. And while I'm giving shout outs to things that I love and use, I've also been using an app called Story Planner to help me with writing my stories as well. So disclaimer number one, I live in the house that Mac built. I am currently recording this podcast on my MacBook Pro. I have a HomePod. I have an Apple TV. I have an iPhone, an iPad, all that kind of thing. This is the house that Apple built. So you have to understand, I don't know if what I'm saying is available for Windows or for um, Android or the Chromebook or anything like that. But Story Planner is a very simple app that I really enjoy that is available for both my iPhone and for my Mac. And it syncs almost instantly. So I can be working on something on my Mac, go outside to take a break or go into town to do something, have an idea loaded up on my phone, write in what I thought of, and then come back and it's right there seamlessly without having to sync. It, it syncs effortlessly in the background and I truly love that. And what it allows me to do is actually track characters, locations, plots, and the scenes of the book. And that is so wonderful for someone like me who is recently becoming more active just writing. So as I introduce my characters, when I describe their physical appearance, I can quickly catalog what they look like, especially if they're a new character that I hadn't pre-thought out or pre-planned to be in the story. I can capture that immediately so I don't have their eyes changing color or their hair changing length magically or something like that. I can capture those ideas very quickly as I'm writing and kind of build all of that pre-writing work that will be there for, for me as I begin my editing project. It also lets me capture the basic gist of each scene as I write the story so that I have that in hand for while I am editing. It connects to Scrivener, and if you're somebody who outlines ahead of time, it actually will export as a, as a Scrivener file. So you can load it up as a Scrivener project, and everything's right there, and you can get into your story and do stuff, which is really, really cool. I've actually used this for editing a couple stories where I used it to help me gather up all the information about the characters that I was working on and then export it back into Scrivener. It was very helpful. <laughs> so I like it a lot. So while I'm reviewing software stuff, it's called Story Planner. It's fairly inexpensive, but it's not free. But I found it to be one of the most useful writing tools in my arsenal lately. But yeah, I, I've really been enjoying working on this book. And I already have ideas for um, the next book in the other series, which I'm planning to write during um, National Novel Writing Month this year. And yeah, writing's going kind of okay, which is important. I hope your writing's doing well. You know, for me, as somebody who struggles with depression and dysphoria, it's not always easy to sit down and tell a story, but it is something that I 
thoroughly enjoy doing, and I love getting your comments on my fiction. So please keep those coming. They really help out a lot. And it's one of the reasons why I started this podcast up again, because I miss talking to you all in the way that we used to talk back when I did this podcast many, many years ago on the regular. And especially now that we have Anchor. And I I, I just want to go on and praise them for a little bit. If you haven't already downloaded the Anchor app, it's available for both iOS and Android. Definitely download it. You can follow me there. You'll get the episodes as soon as they come out. And you can actually use it as your pod tracker there, your podcatcher there. But one of the coolest features that it has is it allows you to do call-ins to the shows that are on there. And if you do that, I'll have your voice message that I can either respond to you privately or I can use it on the show for, say, a question and answer show. Or if you have an idea that you would like discussed, you can leave it over there. And that excites me more than anything because I miss the days back when we used TalkShoe to do this podcast and actually did call-ins and everything. And that was a lot of fun until their system just didn't work. And I don't know if it works any better now because the site's still up, but it looks like it always did. So I don't feel like they've done much to it. I don't know. I haven't used it in a very long time, but I really like anchor and the services that they provide. And it's a great way for us to talk to each other. So if you have any questions or comments, you can definitely load up the anchor app and do a call in and let me know that way. Or you can go to projectshadow.com and get a list of all my social media accounts there. And you can contact me there through the one of your choice. (laughs) But I, I, It feels good. This is a full week back doing an episode every day, and I've missed this. I think it's good for me to be able to get things off my chest. It's been very good because of some of the reaction that I've gotten. I would like to thank Aviva, who shared the episode that I did about her music on Monday. That was very, I mean, that that really made me happy. That was a very good thing. Thank you. I, I needed a boost, especially since I was just you know, getting back into the groove of things after a uh, long mental health break there in the middle. But it's been a lot of fun. If you can support the show, you'll see in the show notes a link to um, the Anchor Support where you can donate one, five, or ten dollars to help with the show. That helps me out a lot. You can go and subscribe um, and uh, subscribe to me over at Patreon. I'm C.E. Dorset on Patreon. But I decided to try using the Anchor stuff because I have a weird relationship with Patreon and I kind of want Patreon to be about my books. And I kind of want to see who really likes the podcast and who really likes the writing. Now... If you like both, you can you can support me in either place, um, or both if that if you so choose. But this gives me a way to see exactly how many people are supporting the podcast and how much people are supporting the podcast, as opposed to the books and the writing that I'm doing, and that helps me get an idea, you know, which I should be spending more time on, because. Honestly, none of this would be happening without your love and support that you've given me over the years. And I really want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing by you. But for that to happen, you know, I have to make a basic income. And so thank you to everybody who buys my books and who shares my books and everything. And to the few of you who have subscribed over at my Patreon, thank you there. But if you really like this podcast and you want to ensure that I'm doing them regularly, subscribing here via the Anchor system is a good way to do that. Because while some people don't think guilt is a good motivator, for me it is. If I see people that are actually supporting the podcast that in that way, it will definitely help me keep my spirits up and help keep me focused on actually making episodes that you all like. So send me a message. Let me know what you think about this. The writing's going really, really well. And we'll see you again on Monday. 
Until then, have the fun.